All right, so this video is just going to be me going through all 125 or 130 questions that are on the 3DR website for the Part 107 test. It's basically a, a really long practice test, but I'm not just going to go through and give you the answers. The whole goal of this is to talk through each question and hopefully get an understanding of the concepts that they want you to understand. You have to know something about these tests. They can be hard. I took mine today and they threw me a lot of curveballs. I got an 88, which I saw was the same score that uh, Tony Northrup had, so I felt okay about that. But but there were some tricky questions on there. And so I'm going to go through and talk about the concepts as we go through the questions. Think of it like a you don't want a pilot taking a test and just having memorized the question, the answers to the questions, you want our pilots and doctors and stuff to take tests to get certified where they actually have to know the stuff. And the FAA is trying to do that. So they have this big test pool of questions, which you've never seen, and they're going to throw something different. They're going to throw a lot of curveballs at you. And uh, so the best course of action is to know the concepts as opposed to the answers to the question. So that's what this is going to be try to do. Uh, can you watch this video by itself and pass the, the Part 107? Uh, maybe, if you follow the things that I also tell you to do. Uh, but I, if you're committed to watching videos to try to get this done, I would at least watch this video as well as Tony Northrup's video, which I'll link in the uh, uh, description. And also follow the advice of checking out other videos. Specifically, there's areas that... Uh, like airspace and especially the whole um, guidelines for attitudes and how to deal with risk management and all that stuff, I will at times say you got to read the section of the, of the study guide. It's just so important that you actually read through it because they're going to ask a ton of weird stuff about it. But we'll get into all that. Let's just get started with question number one. Okay, so the first question, refer to figure 20. Why would the small flag at Lake Drummond in Area 2 of the sectional chart be important to the remote PIC? So let's look at Figure 20. Now, in this case, I, I think a lot of times they want you to just get good at finding airports and things on these sectional charts. But in this case, they've given you that it's in Area 2, which is marked by these uh, red circles. And we can zoom in here and see Lake Drummond in Area 2. And this is the flag that they're talking about. Now, this is a sectional legend, uh, sectional chart legend question, basically. And I would encur encourage you to not just know what this flag is, but to know, go through the legend and learn what all the kind of weird things are. The types of obstructions that this means glider, because there's really no telling what they're going to ask you about this. So... It is really helpful to at least go over the sectional legend to find out what all the weird things are. In this case, um, we've got the flag here, and it's kind of confusing in this chart. It seems that they're wanting to say this is this VFR waypoints is referring to this flag, and that is in fact the correct answer. It is the flag indicates a VFR checkpoint for manned aircraft and a higher volume of traffic uh, air traffic should be expected there so this is basically a sectional legend question and it's always good to brush up on sectional legends according to 14 CFR part 107 the SUAS is an unmanned aircraft system weighing and here uh, they're gonna they're trying to trick you in this question a little bit they're saying less than 55 pounds or 55 pounds or less so the answer here is less than 55 pounds so 55 pounds is a number that you need to remember basically uh, a drone can't weigh 55 pounds it can weigh 54.9 pounds but it can't weigh 55 pounds so that's just one of those numbers you have to memorize okay the next question is about TAF reports uh, it says refer to the figure in the TAF from KOKC. The clear sky becomes, uh, and it gives you this box where you basically need to find out, okay, which airport are we looking at? We're looking at OKC, so we need to be looking in here. And in this case, it's asking um, 
the clear sky becomes. So we need to be able to identify where the clear sky is and what that clear sky will become. But for our purposes, I'm just going to go through this entire list, everything on here, even though it's not really going to be relevant to this question, just because the important thing here is that you learn this, not what the answer to this question is, but that you learn every detail about it, that you actually know how to read this. So that's uh, what we're going to do. So, all right, so let's begin. A TAF report is something that tells about the airport's weather conditions at at the given time specified in the report. So this is what the condi conditions are at the airport. TAFs are much more detailed than their, the METARs, which are basically the same thing uh, and just shorter and easier to do. If you can do these, you can do those. So um, let's read it. So this came from KMEM, the airport. It was issued on the 12th day of the month because, of course, they don't need to give you any more detail than the 12th day because it's a weather report and not that long-lasting. So it's the 12th day of the month at 1720 Zulu time. Zulu time is just how they're referencing the sort of universal time, something that they call it now, but used to be Greenwich Mean Time. Basically, a, a number that the world can agree on is in its 1720 hours. The next set of numbers is when the report is valid through. And it's valid through the 12th day of the month at 1800 hours Zulu to the 13th day of the month at 2400 hours Zulu. So this is the time in which the weather report will be valid. The next set of numbers we know is going to be about wind direction and speed because we see the KT meaning knots. So whenever you see KT, it's talking about wind direction and with, uh, the speed. In this case, the first numbers, it's 200 degrees. Um, the wind is blowing in, uh, in, I guess that would be from, what, like the southwest and uh, at 12 knots is how fast it's blowing. The next is going to be about visibility because we see SM, Statute miles, anytime you see this in one of these reports, it's talking about visibility. In this case, there is five statute miles of visibility around the airport. The next, they throw these kind of random number uh, letters, and they're all codes for types of weather. In this case, it's haze. And then the next bit is going to describe what the clouds are like there. And the clouds are broken and they're broken at 3,000 feet. In this case, we're adding two zeros to this and know that the broken cloud layer is at 3,000 feet at our two zeros. All right, the next group is a probability occurrence. So there is a, in this case, they're gonna warn you about some weather conditions that probably could occur. And that is a 40% probability, prob 40, 40% probability and whenever you see this, this number is a little confusing, this next one. It's actually a time frame. So it's between, two. Th you add two zeros to each number. So between 2,000 and 2,200 hours Zulu time. So whenever you see a probability, know that they're going to have to give you a time frame in which this probability might occur uh, within this broader time period. When will this condition set occur? Between 2,000 and 2,200 hours, there might be one statute mile of visibility, so low visibility with TSRA. These are two weather conditions. I don't know why they grouped them together, but they do. So thunderstorms and rain. Again, you can refer to your chart if you need to with those. The next is cloud conditions, overcast. Again, these are there's not that many of them, so you kind of memorize these by accident. But so overcast. And we're going to add two zeros, so 800 feet. So pretty low clouds. And what type of clouds are these? CB cumulonimbus. Those are the dangerous ones. Remember the thunderheads and stuff. So overcast, 800 feet, cumulonimbus clouds. They need to put that because that's the one everybody is worried about, the cumulonimbus. All right, so the rest of this report, starting at the FM, which means from... 2200 hours Zulu time. So it's going to tell us within the time frame here, remember this report which was issued here is actually valid. You can expect these conditions through 1218 through 13, 20, uh, 
uh, 13th day of the month, 2400 hours. So it's a pretty broad time frame in which a lot can happen to the weather. So that's what the froms here are all about, describing uh, what the weather is going to do all in between this time frame. So from 2200 hours, and we know the next one is wind, we got our knots. So the, the it, uh, from 2200 hours, the wind is going to be coming in at 330 degrees at 15 knots with gusts up to 20 knots. The P here stands for plus, basically. So you're going to have plus or better than six miles of visibility, statute miles. We see visibility because we know it's statute miles. The clouds are going to be broken at 1,500 feet, overcast at 2,500 feet, and there is a 40% probability that between 2,200 hours and 200 hours, there will be three statute miles of visibility and showers and rain. Then from 200 hours, uh, wait, yeah, it will be two, th yeah, from 200 hours, uh, three, the wind is going to come in at 350 degrees at 12 knots. It'll be overcast at 800 feet. There's a 40% probability that uh, between 200 and 500 hours, there will be two statute miles of vis visibility with rain and snow, uh, which that becomes uh, between the hours of 600 and 800, it will become windy. It will become, uh, wind will come in at 20 degrees at 8 knots uh, with broken clouds at uh, 1,200 feet. All right, so the next line says that it's becoming, kind of could see that when you look at it, so it's becoming, uh, and here they've gone back to the other date format that we saw up here where the days of the month were included. So on the 13th day, which is all still within this time period, but a smaller chunk of it between on the 13th day between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 hours Zulu the wind will come in at zero degrees zero knots there will be three statute miles of visibility BR is one of these that can trip you up because it is one of those that you wouldn't expect so it's missed and you can just look that up on your um, uh, legend so where were we three statute miles of visibility with mist then uh, the sky's clear. That's what that means. SKC sky's clear. Tempo means temporary condition, and this is stuff that they expect to happen, not be long lasting, like some really strong winds for a little while or something like that. Uh, temporary condition between 12 12 and 12 14. Again, that's the uh, days of the month and. Um, hours, 1200 and 1400 hours Zulu, with one half statute mile visi vi visibility with fog, and then finally and from 131600, so that's almost to the end of this forecast, from 131600 there will be variable wind at six knots, so it's going to come from lots of different directions at six knots, and then plus six statute miles of visibility um, and then skies clear. Okay, let's try to go through the next one and also figure out what the answer to our question is, which is uh, from KOKC, the clear sky becomes. So we'll be looking for that. So here we are at the one we're supposed to look at, and we know that this was issued on the fifth day of the month at 11.30 Zulu time, and it's valid through the fifth day of the month at 1,200 hours to the sixth day of the month at 1800 hours. The winds are going to be coming in at uh, 140 degrees, 8 knots, be 5 statute miles of visibility with we now know mist, uh, broken clouds at 3000 feet, a temporary condition valid through 51300 through 51600 is that the visibility will be 1 and 1 half statute miles. There will be mist and then from 5 the fifth day at 1600 hours Zulu. The wind is going to come in at, at 180 degrees at 10 knots. There will be plus or more than six miles visibility. The sky is clear, becoming 
between 52200 and 52400 um, the the wind will come in at 200 degrees at 13 knots with gusts up to 20 four statute miles of vis visibility showers rain overcast at 2000 feet a 40% probability that between 6 at 0 hundred hours and 6 at 600 hours there will be two statute miles of visibility with thunder uh, showers and rain overcast at 8,000 feet cumulonimbus clouds becoming between uh, 6 at 600 hours and the sixth day of the week at 800 hours the wind will come in at 210 degrees at 15 knots greater than 6 statute miles of visibility scattered clouds at 4,000 feet. So what the answer is, is we actually can see clear skies, SKC, becoming, which is what this question is asking. What does the clear sky become at KOKC? And the clear sky becomes, but it's also going to make sure we know we're getting the right one because it's going to give us a time frame. So if there were two of these kinds of things, clear sky becomes, you would actually know which one because of the time frame. But we can actually see it too. If you get tripped up, you can use uh, the visibility. Here we have greater than six miles of visibility, and that's uh, clear skies. But that becomes, and we look, it's going to become overcast. So clear skies are going to become overcast at 2,000 feet. We can see right away that that's probably going to be this one because all the other ones say 200 feet. But I would say don't use that. Always read the entire question of of these and and especially the, the question and the answers because there are trick questions I mean it just there are a lot of them so you have to make sure you read everything because they might be trying to trip you up and uh, in this case though we can see it's going to become overcast at 2,000 feet let's double check that we're right by making sure our time frame is right and it says between 2200 Zulu and 2400 Zulu so let's see if that's right the clear sky becomes between 2200 2400 Zulu so we know we're right 2,000 feet it is definitely that one loading cameras or other equipment on an SUAS mount the items in a manner that can easily be removed without the use of tools what do they care about that um, that's nonsense so is visible to the visual observer or other crew members they don't talk anything about that the only thing that they mention when talking about adding things to your drone pretty much is that it does not adversely affect the center of gravity. That's the main thing that they're concerned about if you're putting stuff on your drones or mounting things. They talk a lot about the center of gravity. Next says, refer to figure 20. Who would a remote pilot in command contact to check NOTAMs as it is noted in the caution box regarding the unmarked balloon? So NOTAMs are uh, notices to airmen, they are uh, flight warnings about conditions that may be in a particular area. Sometimes they can be emergencies, it can be all kinds of different things. So this seems like a little bit of misdirection. So we look and the balloons, the unmarked balloons are kind of in these boxes so far that I've seen. And it says, caution unmarked balloon on a cable to 3,008 feet MSL, check notams but it doesn't tell us where to check them and it gives us a link to the sectional legend here and I didn't find exactly what they want I, it, it might be here but and I'll probably kick myself for not seeing it but as far as I understand it it could be just total misdirection but in these kinds of questions when they're asking about uh, who do you contact about such and such they do kind of you can kind of tell what they mean we know that they probably don't want you to contact their district office. That would be such a bureaucratic nightmare. So they don't want you to contact them, as I think what they want, want you to know. But because they've set up all kinds of important uh, portals for people to get this stuff, they can call a phone number, they can look online, they can do a lot of different things. In this case, it's calling it flight service is the answer. Flight Service is a, a proper name of a website that does a lot of different things. Sometimes you, it's basically you can check NOTAMs, and it's something that they have um, uh, provided and want you to know about how to do. It's, it doesn't say website or anything else like that. This is a proper name of what it's called, the Flight Service. But it might show up in other questions as a, a phone number or a, um, 
a website address or different things but they don't want you to contact the offices they want you to use the portals that they've created for all these different things which technique should a pilot use to scan for traffic the options are concentrate on relative movement detected in the peripheral vision area systematically focus on different segments of the sky for short intervals and continuous sweeping of the windshield from right to left so the answer is systematically focus on different segments of the sky at short intervals. Let's see if we can find where they want us to learn about that. So yeah, they in the study guide they include this chart, but what they the main things that they want you to understand is to basically you're going to be looking at an area and that and then moving on to another sort of segment of the sky and each time sh uh, sh should last no longer than 2 to 3 seconds but you're basically just scanning portions of the sky. It recommends to scan approximately 30 degrees wide in each segment. Now the 10%, which is a number that will come up in these tests, in the practice tests anyway, is um, how much it wants you to overlap that 30 degree area. So maybe you've got a 30 degree arc that you're scanning and the next, when you move over, it should sort of overlap with your first scan within that 10 degree area. So 10 degrees, 30 degrees, um, each each time should last no longer than two to three seconds. And uh, so that's the answer to that question. Okay, this one says refer to figure 21. What airport is located approximately 47 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude and 101 degrees, 26 minutes west longitude? So you basically need to know how to uh, do latitude and longitude. You're going to look for these numbers here on the grid. We see a 101 and a 48. Anyway, so you need to know that each one of these ticks is a minute. So you could theoretically, and we know it's going to be 101 degrees and 26 minutes, and we know that 101 degrees is starting at this line, and we need to know that these are that the lines are climbing. Uh, west, basically the opposite way that we, we read. I heard it explained that it's kind of like America was founded on the east coast and it's moving out from there. That's one way to remember it anyway. And you basically can just count 101, uh, 1011, 1012, etc. until you get to 26, which we can actually do if we each one of these is 5 and the longer ones are 10, so we could just count ahead. That's 10, 20, 5, and 6, and we see that, well, at least we know that that's where this is. The next thing it wants us to know is the 47 degrees, 40 minutes. So we see 48 here, and we know it's counting up. So this is 48. The next one up here would be 48 uh, degrees, 30 minutes, and the next one would be 49. But... Here, we, counting backwards, we know that this is 47 degrees, 30 minutes. So this line right here, 47 degrees, 30 minutes. And it's asking for 47 degrees, 40 minutes. So basically from this line, we're counting up 10. And that's right here. And there are less ticks going up than there are going this way. So don't be fooled by relative uh, space. So counting, you might want to count individually. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And we already know that it's going to be Garrison Airport that lines up with these. Okay, this says the FAA may approve your application for a waiver of provisions in Part 107 only when it has been determined that the proposed operation. So the key thing here is a waiver. A waiver is something you're probably never going to really do unless you want to do something that's not really covered in the normal rules of Part 107. For example, there's talk now of waivers, I mean it's very rare, but waivers to fly over people, which you should never ever ever do, um, people that are not, you don't have their approval, and um, but in this case you could theoretically file a waiver with the FAA to fly over people, but there's this huge thing, a list of things that they want to and special things you need to do to your drone and all kinds of things to get that waiver. So what's the answer? 
can safely be conducted under the terms of the Certificate of Waiver, involves public aircraft or air carrier operations, will be conducted outside the United States. No, 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 no. If they're going to let you get a waiver, they're going to make sure that it can safely be conducted under the terms and certificate of waiver. Okay, this next question, which says, when adapting crew resource management CRM concepts to the operation of a small UA, CRM must be integrated into all phases of the operation, is the answer that they want. Um, of course, the flight portion only and the, the communications only. What you need to know about this is that crew resource management, which is a sub part of, um, let's see if I can find uh, chapter 10, which crew resource management is a subheading of, it's the aeronautical decision making and judgment thing. They're going to ask and, and want you to really know a lot of weird phrases and things that are on here. You got to understand about this, this particular chapter. It's very, very important to them. In fact, they decided basically that this whole little thing, aeronautical decision making and judgment, is that its teaching techniques are reducing pilot errors. They did a study and found out that all this percentage of stuff was done on pilot human errors and judgment things. So they had this big bureaucratic thing and they came up with this whole system to try to teach you how to think, basically. And they believe it works and they have all this stuff that say it does work and whatever. So what you have to understand is that you have to really read through this part of the study guide for no other reason because it'll get you familiarized with weird terms that if you normally looked at on a test question you would say there's no way they're using that word or this thing and it's not just the macho and invulnerability stuff it's other other weird things like the pave checklist and all this stuff you got to understand they're super serious about this at least read through it one time and know which kind of phrases and stuff that it's talking about because it will be uh, an important uh, part of the test and a lot of questions will be about that in this case, it's just a crew resource management about that, and it should be integrated into all phases of the operation. We need to understand unstable air versus stable air. This is something that you pretty much just have to memorize or, or learn for yourself. Learn exactly what they mean, because they're going to ask this in a lot of different ways. There's no way to really prepare for it except for just to know it. So um, let's look at it. Unstable air and stable air are a little bit weird because they're kind of the reverse of what you might think. Uh, let's look at stable air as a good place to start because stable air is characterized by having stratiform clouds and fog. So stratiform clouds are the ones that, I mean, if you saw, you'd say, oh man, it's going to be, you know, going to rain today. It's going to be not a nice day. They're kind of on the same level, they're a little bit flat. I don't know exactly how to describe them, but basically um, stratiform clouds and fog. It's going to have continuous precipitation, which is kind of what you would expect from a situation like that. Now, it's going to have smooth air, and that's why it's called stable air. I don't know exactly why those conditions would result in smooth air. It's probably because of air density or something like that, but whatever it is, well, actually, now that I think about it, I do kind of know what it is, but uh, we'll get to it. So smooth air is characteristic of stable air. That's the main reason this seems in my head as stable is the smooth air. But it also has fair to poor visibility in haze and smoke. I'm not sure how smoke comes into it, but it, what you need to know is it has poor visibility. So stable air has almost nothing going for it except for smooth air. It's got stratiform clouds. It's raining all the time. It's got really poor visibility. The only thing I can see positive about stable air is that the air is smooth. On the other hand, unstable air, this is unstable air. Now, a good way to visualize this is by looking at a couple things. Here's a drawing showing, you know, a nice white puffy cloud, a cumulus cloud. The reason a cumulus cloud is that way is because there's air uh, rising into it and kind of pushing it up. In fact, the whole the study guide has this whole thing about uh, the life cycle of a thunderstorm. And it starts life as a cumulus cloud, a nice white puffy cloud, but it goes bad 
uh, gets in, involved with the wrong crowd, and the air pushes it way up into the atmosphere, which causes all kinds of dew point things and stuff to basically turn into rain and become a cumulonimbus cloud, which is the thing that they are mostly concerned about telling you a dangerous cloud is a cumulonimbus. It's a cumulus cloud with the suffix nimbus, which means rain and Latin or something. So it, it, you can kind of see the difference in your head now. The stratus cloud, we don't like those. That's still air, though. Um, and the unstable air is a uh, cumulus, cumuliform clouds. Showery precipitation with unstable air. Now, with this is kind of confusing because... Every time I've ever seen these described, they both have precipitation. It's like there's no kind of air that does not have precipitation, but it's either going to be showery or continuous. Continuous. So showery would be like sporadic or whatever, uh, but continuous and stable air would just be all the time, I guess. Next, with unstable air, rough air turbulence. That's caused by the air rushing up into the cumulus clouds. So unstable air the reason it's unstable is because the air is rough because there's turbulence that's the thing that's different is because there is upward rushing air the next and final characteristic is that it has good visibility except in blowing obstructions so good visibility with unstable air so if you can get this in your head that if you can picture what an unstable air day would be like in my head, I have it like, oh, great, it's unstable outside. I'm going to have a wonderful day. But the oxymoronic uh, reverse would be, oh, man, it's stable outside. It's going to be a terrible day. You know, it's just a reverse of, of, of reality. It's the uh, bizarro. All right, so the next question is, what are the characteristics of moist, unstable air mass? Hopefully what we learned before will help us to answer this question now. So... It's moist. Well, if I remember, both unstable and stable were described as having some kind of precipitation, either showery or uh, persistent or constant uh, precipitation. But what is an unstable air mass? Well, remember we said we'd rather be outside on an unstable day because it's got clear visibility, white puffy clouds. So we're looking for an, that kind of day. Uh, poor visibility and smooth air. Nope, that is the exact opposite. That is uh, the characteristics of a stable uh, mass. Stratiform clouds, no, we no right there. Stratiform is in stable, not unstable. And showery precipitation, nope. Cumuliform clouds, that looks right so far. And showery precipitation, the exact things that we're looking for when we are looking for an unstable air mass. This one says, refer to figure two. If an unmanned airplane weighs 33 pounds, what, uh, what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude? So one of the main things that the FAA wants you to know is that when you take a really hard turn with your drone, it's going to increase the load factor. And, you know, each aircraft is designed to support a certain amount of load. Um, so it needs, you need to know if Another thing that it'll kind of ask you is like what factors have to do with load factor or weight on the airplane, and the answer will be any flight except for straight and narrow flight. Basically, it wants you to know that turns create load. So in this case, we take the weight of the air aircraft, which is 33 pounds, and we know that it's banking at 30 degrees. So we look for 30 degrees, and that's in between 1 and 2, and we don't need to know exactly... Um, what? Because it tells us right here, a 30 degree turn actually is 1.154. So you take the weight of the aircraft, in this case 33 pounds, times uh, 1.154, and that gets 38.08. In this case, we'll just hit 38 pounds. I will say that some of them later are, get a little bit confusing, but We'll talk about that when we get there. And it says, when operating an unmanned airplane, a remote pilot should consider that the load factor on the wings may be increased anytime. Again, the load factor is 
the airplane is subjected to maneuvers other than straight and level flight, the gross, the gross weight is reduced, or the center of gravity is shifted rearward to the aft center of gravity limit. Now there are questions about center of gravi gravity too, but the main thing you need to know is that the FAA wants you to know that right and left bank turns at higher degrees increase a load factor. So the airplane is subject to maneuvers other than straight and level flight. So your flight patterns will affect the load factor. What action should a remote pilot take when operating in, mil in a military operations area or MOA? Now this one is a little confusing because there are different, you might tend to think of a military operations area as like a military base. And of course you can't go flying on a military base, but military operations area can can be a really big broad area. Let's say that there's a military base, um, you know, a couple towns over or whatever, even in that town, um, you may be in an MOA, but not necessarily in a restricted area. It just basically means you need to pay more attention. In this case, it, it'll say different, different things about that. The options it gives you here is obtain authorization from the controlling agency prior to operating in an MOA. Exercise extreme caution when military activity is being conducted or, and fly along military training routes. Well, you definitely don't want to fly over military training routes because um, they can actually go quite low on those and they're shown on the uh, maps by lines with numbers in them and uh, they're called MTRs. But So you don't want to do that. That's the obvious one. Um, you want to exercise extreme caution when military activity is being conducted. Now, you, you can there's different ways to check when that military operations area might be active but uh, it's basically not necessarily controlled airspace it's just as a, in a place where you need to be more uh, aware that military operations are nearby so that's what that is what is the forecast uh, wind for KMEM from 1600 Zulu until the end of the forecast all right well, let's see here. For KMEM, so it wants to know what the forecast wind is uh, from 1600Z until the end of the forecast. Well, here's KMEM, and let's just kind of work backwards, okay? Because we find 1600Z here, you know, if it's going to be to the end of the forecast, we know we need to start at the bottom because there's so many changes here um, that are going on. We need to know what the weather is going to be to the end of the forecast. So let's work backwards and we see from the 13th day till 1600 hours. So we're exactly matched up. Everything looks good and wants to know the wind. So it's going to be variable at six knots. And here we see that answer variable in direction at six knots. A pilot should be should be able to overcome the symptoms or avoid future occurrences of hyperventilation by okay so what hyperventilation is is when you hyperventilate you breathe too much and when you do that you get too much oxygen in your blood and it can cause all kinds of problems so you need to basically um, not breathe as much and so it gives you lots of different ways to word that it says slowing the breathing rate breathing into a bag or talking out loud, closely monitoring the air traffic's tele telemetry data, or increasing the breathing rate in order to increase lung ventilation. So the answer is A, you want to slow the breathing rate. You don't want as much oxygen. And they basically have a whole section on these kinds of things that you really, again, need to read through in the study guide. Because just knowing the answers to these kinds of test questions isn't necessarily going to help you because there's going to be weirder things in hyperventilation that they might uh, quiz you on. This one says, refer to figure two. If an unmanned airplane weighs 33 pounds, what, uh, what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude? So one of the main things that the FAA wants you to know is that when you take a really hard turn with your drone it's going to increase the load factor and you know each aircraft is designed to support a certain amount of load um, so it needs you need to know if 
another thing that it'll kind of ask you is like what factors have to do with load factor or weight on the airplane and the answer will be any flight except for straight and narrow flight basically it wants you to know that turns create load so in this case we take the weight of the air aircraft which is 33 pounds and we know that it's banking at 30 degrees so we look for 30 degrees and that's in between one and two and we don't need to know exactly um, what because it tells us right here a 30 degree turn actually is 1.154 so you take the weight of the aircraft in this case 33 pounds times uh, 1.154 and that gets 38.08 in this case we'll just hit 38 pounds I will say that some of them later are, get a little bit confusing but we'll talk about that when we get there also about that it says when operating an unmanned airplane a remote pilot should consider that the load factor on the wings may be increased anytime again the load factor is the airplane is subjected to maneuvers other than straight and level flight the gross the gross weight is reduced or the center of gravity is shifted rearward to the aft center of gravity limit now there are questions about center of gravi gravity too but the main thing you need to know is that the FAA wants you to know that right and left bank turns at higher degrees increase a load factor. So the airplane is subject to maneuvers other than straight and level flight. So your flight patterns will affect the load factor. What action should a remote pilot take when operating in, mil in a military operations area or MOA? Now this one is a little confusing because there are different you might tend to think of a military operations area as like a military base and of course you can't go flying on a military base but military operations area can can be a really big broad area let's say that there's a military base um, you know a couple towns over or whatever even in that town um, you may be in an MOA but not necessarily in a restricted area it just basically means you need to pay more attention in this case it don't, it'll say different different things about that. The options it gives you here is obtain authorization from the controlling agency prior to operating in an MOA, exercise extreme caution when military activity is being conducted, or, and fly along military training routes. Well, you definitely don't want to fly over military training routes because um, they can actually go quite low on those, and they're shown on the uh, maps by lines with numbers in them and uh, they're called MTRs but so you don't want to do that that's the obvious one um, you want to exercise extreme caution when military activity is being conducted now you, you can there's different ways to check when that military operations area might be active but uh, it's basically not necessarily controlled airspace it's just as a, in a place where you need to be more uh, aware that military operations are nearby so that's what that is. What is the forecast uh, wind for KMEM from 1600 Zulu until the end of the forecast? All right. Well, let's see here. For KMEM, so it wants to know what the forecast wind is uh, from 1600 Z until the end of the forecast. Well, here's KMEM, and let's just kind of work backwards, okay? Because we find 1600 Z here. You know, if it's going to be to the end of the forecast, we know we need to start at the bottom because there's so many changes here um, that are going on. We need to know what the weather is going to be to the end of the forecast. So let's work backwards. And we see from the 13th day till 1600 hours. So we're exactly matched up. Everything looks good and wants to know the wind. So it's going to be variable at six knots. And here we see that answer variable. In direction at six knots. A pilot should be should be able to overcome the symptoms or avoid future occurrences of hyperventilation by okay so what hyperventilation is is when you hyperventilate you breathe too much and when you do that you get too much oxygen in your blood and it can cause all kinds of problems so you need to basically um, not breathe as much and so it gives you lots of different ways to word that it says 
slowing the breathing rate, breathing into a bag or talking out loud, closely monitoring the air traffic's tele <laughs> telemetry data, or increasing the breathing rate in order to increase lung ventilation. So the answer is A, you want to slow the breathing rate. You don't want as much oxygen. And they basically have a whole section on these kinds of things that you really, again, need to read through in the study guide. Because just knowing the answers to these kinds of test questions isn't necessarily going to help you. Because there's going to be weirder things in hyperventilation that they might uh, quiz you on. So you need to read through that section in the uh, study guide. All right, so this, this says, according to 14 CFR Part 48, when, a per, when must a person register a small UA with the Federal Aviation Administration? So this is not talking about um, this, the Part 107. This is just about anybody, whether they're flying it commercially or flying it for their own personal use or hobbyist purposes, if it's over 0.55 pounds, so just over half a pound, which almost all drones are, they have to be registered. The only other thing that it might ask you about this registration process is that um, you have to be 13 years old to register uh, a, a drone. So if you were under 13 and you had a drone, which almost certainly is over, over 0.55 pounds, somebody else would have to register that. A 13-year-old could not. Um, next what is the antidote when a pilot has a hazardous attitude such as anti-authority? So this is that hazardous attitude section of the study guide where it showcases a lot of different ones. Anti-authority is pretty obvious. This is the type of person that says, I don't want to follow the rules. So the antidote to such an idea would be to follow the rules. Um, so you got to know what antidote means because rules do not apply in this situation. Might You might be thinking it's asking the question, what is anti-authority? So read the question closely. What is the antidote it wants to know? What is the antidote when a pilot has a hazardous attitude such as resignation? Resignation is the idea that, oh, there's nothing much I could do about it anyway. You know, I might as well, whatever. And so the antidote to that is that, I am not helpless. I can have an effect on having a safe safe flight or preventing crashes, etc. All right, the next question is between 1000 Zulu and 1200 Zulu, the visibility at KMM is forecast to be. So first we need to distinguish which one of these two are we're looking at and it's KMM, so we're looking in the lighter colored block and probably we're looking for a statute mile number. But probably the best way to look this one up is to just try to find the 1000 Zulu to 1200 Zulu time frame. So it's going to be one of those that are giving you a, um, a range. And here we find it between, and here it's uh, showing the day first. So between 1000 and 1200, the statute miles, or rather the visibility, is going to be three statute miles, which we see is the, an answer down here. So we'll choose that. And we can double check because, you know, even if you were thinking, okay, well, but there's statute miles listed over here. Am I making sure it's not that? Well, yeah, you know it isn't because this is between 1,200 and 1,400, which doesn't match up with that. So that was the best way to look that up. Okay, it says refer to the figure and answer what is the approximate latitude and longitude of Cooperstown Airport. So this is a latitude longitude question and we need to first start out by finding Cooperstown and we got lucky there's not many airports on this one. Here it is. So what is the latitude and longitude? And we're looking, we're looking for our numbers and we find them right here. We find that this is 99 and that's 47. So we need to know what this is right here. So if this is 99, this is 98.30, and this is 98, okay? So let's first find out what that is. So 98, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'd say, yeah, I'd say that's about right. I'd say 98 degrees, 6 minutes, Let's see if we have anything already for that. Uh, yeah, well, two of them have 98 degrees, six minutes, okay? So let's find out what the other part is. What's the 
uh, 47 and we need to go all the way up here that's kind of a far ways away so we'll count by uh, tens in this case remember there's kind of more space between them than there is down here so this would be 47 10 this would be 47 20 and we'll just count 21 22 23 24 25 25 or 26 47 25 there it is so we already looked up the 98 6 so that is the answer there Next, determine the approximate latitude and longitude of the Manut International Airport. Manut, I don't know. So, again, we got to figure it out. This one's pretty easy. There it is right there. So, let's just count. We know 101. This must be 101 uh, degrees and 30 minutes. So, let's just count. 101, 10 minutes, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's about 17. So 101, 17, somewhere around there. Uh, well, 101, 16, and it's the only one that has uh, 101, 16. So we can be almost positive that that's what it is, but let's just, for the sake of argument, figure out the rest of it. So we need to know what the latitude is 48 degrees we can skip up and say this is 48 degrees 10 minutes 48 10 11 12 13 14 15 15 or 16 so that's where we're looking right there in that where the runway is so let's see 48 degrees 16 and 101 16 so that's what we had Next, who holds the responsibility to ensure all crew members who are participating in the operations are not impaired by drugs and alcohol? Who holds the responsibility to ensure all crew members? Is it the contractor? Well, we've never heard of him really much before, so probably not. The remote pilot in command or the site supervisor? Well, both of those, we don't really, they're just kind of official sounding names, but almost always, don't take it as the, you know, the gospel or anything, but uh, it's going to be the remote pilot in command that is in charge of a lot of things in these scenarios. Next, uh, refer to the chart at which at quarter lane, which is uh, which frequency w should be used as the common traffic advisory frequency or CTAF to monitor airport traffic. So, let's look at the map. We see quarter lane airport right here. Now the CTAF is something that we can figure out in the legend, but uh, just looking closely at it here, we see the C right here is the CTAF symbol. Let's look at the legend really quick so we can see that. When we look at the airport data on the legend, we see this C and what it's being referred to. We find that down here. C follows the common traffic advisory frequency or CTAF. One thing you need to know about the CTAF is that when you see it, the number, well, let's see here, the number is to the left of the C. So it's a little confusing. You find the C and you find the number to the left. In that case, uh, what you would, if you had like an aircraft radio, it would be 122.8 megahertz. And that's what the CTAF is for Coeur d'Alene Airport. Next question, the elevation of Shoshone County Airport, Airport is, and let's first find out where the airport is, and it's uh, over here. It's kind of a small little airport. It wants to know what the elevation is. The elevation is on the left side here in it italics. It is 2,227 feet. This will usually not have any zeros dropped off of it. Uh, when it's talking about elevation of an airport in this uh, code right here, it's going to tell you what the elevation is in true numbers. So 2,227, and you can find that out in the legend as well if you forget. It'll tell you where the elevation can be found. Finally, the most comprehensive information on a given airport is provided by... Now, this is referring to the sectional charts that we've been looking at are fine, 
but there are actually like a whole different sectional chart which is not included here that's regarding every single airport there are uh, small um, smaller or with more detail about particular airports and stuff and those are called chart supplements formerly airport facility directory that's the most what's the question asking the most comprehensive information on a given airport is where we're gonna find that in a chart supplement not notices to airmen that's not even what they are and it's not a terminal area chart it is a chart supplement all right next question refer to figure two if an airplane weighs 23 pounds what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 60 degree bank turn while maintaining altitude so we know it's 23 pounds at a 60 degree um, bank it would be two load factory G units now we actually know it's exactly two because well no actually look at this no it is 60 degrees is two so we only have to do this um, multiplication by two so 23 pounds times two is 46 we don't even need a calculator for that one and there is the answer Within how many days must an SUAS accident be reported to the FAA? This is, if you have any kind of accident, especially if it is a serious accident, and it's kind of spelled out what serious means. It, it doesn't want you to think, oh, yeah, I got a cut, I got a bruise, a small thing. It doesn't want you to report that. But it gives examples like if you have to go to the hospital for more than 48 hours or if somebody loses consciousness or serious accidents, um, and it describes that in terms of damaged property too, which we'll get into later. But the answer for how many days before uh, uh, does it need to be reported within? And it's 10 days. Just got to remember, 10 days. Just got to remember it. Next question is about battery safety again. Something they want you to know about. Damaged lithium batteries can cause increased endurance. Well, I'm sure they don't want you to think that. A change in aircraft center of gravity well no I can't think of why that would be but I suppose it's possible and in-flight fire is what they want you to know they want you to know that batteries can be dangerous next before each flight the remote PIC must ensure that objects carried on the SUAS are secure uh, the site supervisor has approved the flight or ATC is granting clearance. It's a little bit of a trick question here because um, you might think ATC is granting clearance, but the key to that is, is before each flight, every flight that you ever take with a drone needs to be cr cl uh, cleared with uh, air traffic control? No, of course not. Not unless you're flying in controlled airspace. Um, so every time objects carried on the SUAS are secure. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense of a question but just they want you to know when talking about attaching objects to your drone they want you to make sure it's very very secure and they want you to make sure it is not disrupting the center of gravity so we know because of uh, the way this question is worded that it must be the objects carried on the SUAS are secure next question you may operate an SUAS from a moving vehicle when no property is car uh, carried for compensation or higher over a parade or other social events over suburban areas over a sparsely populated area so it wants to know can you operate your drone from a moving vehicle um, and here the answer is yes you can over a sparsely populated area the way I think about it is if you're on a boat a uh, boat is a technically a moving vehicle and you can operate it on a boat over a sparsely populated area so that is the answer for that one to avoid a possible coll uh, collision with a manned airplane you estimate that your small ua climb to an altitude greater than 600 feet agl to whom must you report the deviation okay so this is if 
let's say you're out flying a drone and there is some kind of emergency emergency situation where the only way you can get out of it is to fly over 400 feet which is the limit that you can fly you can't fly any higher than 400 feet but in this scenario you had to fly 600 feet to avoid a plane or something if you do that uh, you're not required to unless they ask you. Let's say this whole thing was reported on something and whatever. They, if they ask you to do that, then you need to report it to the FAA. Not Air Traffic Control, not the National Transportation Safety Board, the FAA. This is just almost kind of like a memorization question. FAA upon request. FAA upon request. <laughs> The next question, the elevation of Chesapeake Regional Airport is, so it wants to know the elevation of Chesapeake Regional, and here on the left in italics, it's kind of confusing because it's only 19 feet above sea level, which should make sense. It's right next to the sea, so 19 feet sea level is the answer to this question. If an unstable air mass is forced upward, what type of clouds can be expected? Okay, so we already know the unstable air mass has uh, cumulus clouds, right? But we uh, know that what they want you to be concerned about is especially cumulus clouds turning into cumulonimbus clouds or thunderheads. And that happens when air goes, pushes that cloud even higher up in the air which causes all kinds of things to happen with dew point and all this stuff that causes thunderstorms so what will happen if an unstable air mass is forced upward what type of clouds can be expected stratus clouds with considerable associated turbulence no we know they're not going to be stratus clouds clouds with considerable vertical development and associated turbulence well, that sounds the best so far. They don't specify which type of clouds here, but we know that it's going to be considerable vertical development. That's exactly what is to be expected in an unstable air mass and turbulence. And we know that it's not this one because it says stratus on the second one too. So clouds with considerable vertical development and associated turbulence. It basically is asking you a completely different way if you understand what a stable and unstable air mass is. So the best course of action is to just take the time to learn that. Next question. How would a remote PIC check NOTAMs as noted in the caution box regarding the marked balloon? We got another question basically worded the same thing. We got to go look for a marked balloon thing. They're easy to find um, here in like a little box like this. And again, it doesn't tell us how to check the NOTAMs. It just tells us what the unmarked balloon uh, what its uh, altitude is. So the so it wants to know where are you going to check a NOTAM. You can either by utilizing the Before You Fly mobile application. Now the Before You Fly mobile application is a thing that you know can tell you some stuff about airspace and stuff like that. But so far, I don't think it tells you anything about NOTAMs or whatever. This is one of those that it wants you to use one of their services or a service they recommend. And that, in this case, is by obtaining a briefing via online an online source such as 1-800-WXBrief.com. It's certainly not by contacting the FAA district office. It doesn't want you to do that. So check a NOTAM by, in this case, uh, obtaining a briefing via uh, online source. As a remote pilot operating near an airport, you should expect arriving aircraft to join the traffic pattern at, and the answer to this is 45 degrees to downwind. And I'll show you a um, uh, kind of a diagram of how to, to remember this. All right, this is a diagram in the flying uh, handbook from the FAA. So basically, the wind in this case is going this way to the left. So an airplane coming from wherever it's coming from needs to enter this entire pattern at a 45 degree angle uh, going down wind or with the wind. And they'll take a left in the because the traffic pattern for planes is turning left. Then usually their final approach will be at upwind. And then when they have, if they have to keep going around crosswind, let's say they're taking off this crosswind, here is called the base. Um, which will be important later. So basically, it's almost a memorization thing. 
they enter the traffic pattern at a 45 degree angle going downwind. All right, this question says, which basic flight maneuver increases the load factor on an airplane as compared to straight and level flight? And this is now the third question that they've asked that basically wants uh, you to understand that not stalls, not climbs, but turns, turns are what can increase your load factor. The degree of your turn will increase the load factor. Next question, what is the one common factor which affects, affects most preventable accidents? The answer is human error. This, this question, if you know why they put this here, is important to them. They're saying that their whole um, process, which I described earlier, for trying to reduce human error, which is all these acronyms like PAVE and all these things that try to teach you how to think, um, is something they're very proud of. So human error is the one common factor which affects most preventable accidents. Some key words there. Which of the following considerations is most relevant to a remote PIC when evaluating unmanned aircraft performance? Okay, this is one you kind of have to think about. What's the, what considerations are most relevant to the pilot in command when evaluating aircraft performance? Well, okay, is it the type of the UAS operation? Well, that doesn't really determine how you're going to perform, how the craft is going to perform. The number of available ground crew? Well, no, that doesn't really have any bearing on how the aircraft is going to perform. Current weather conditions has a lot to do with how the aircraft will perform. The study guide makes a big deal about how weather conditions affect the performance of an aircraft. For example, uh, high density, altitude, and all that stuff, which I'm sure we're going to get to in a little bit. All right, this one says, according to Part 107, how may, how may a remote pilot operate an unmanned aircraft in Class C airspace? So remembering Class B and C are the two biggest types of airports. In any case, is going to be controlled airspace. And as you should know by now, that anytime you're going to be in controlled airspace, you do need to contact the air traffic controller, ATC, um, and it can take up to 90 days to get that approval, although things are moving faster and more services are becoming available. Long story short, the answer to this one is going to be kind of a trick question based on when to contact the ATC. The remote pilot must contact the air traffic control facility after launching. No, the, the remote pilot must monitor air traffic control frequency uh, from launch to recovery. Do you have to listen to the frequency while you're doing that? No. The remote pilot must have prior authorization from ATC, uh, having from the ATC having jurisdiction over that airspace. You have to do that, pr get prior authorization. Next question. You have been hired as remote pilot by a local TV news station to film breaking news with a small UA. You expressed a safe safety concern and the station manager has instructed you to fly first, ask questions later. What type of attitude does this attitude represent? And here we go back to their sort of terms for hazardous attitudes. In this case, it's going to be impulsivity. This person wants to get out there and get the footage. We'll worry about that later. He's being impulsive. So that is the answer there. All right, the next question, responsibility for collision avoidance in controlled airspace rests with air traffic control, all pilots, or the controlling agency. This one's kind of intended to trip you up a little bit. You might have a tendency to think air traffic control should have responsible for collision avoidance, but really all pilots are held responsible for not flying into one another. Um, next question, if an airplane weighs 33 pounds, what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude? Okay, so this one is a little bit different. Um, so we've got 33. Uh, 33 is the weight of the aircraft. It's going to be doing a 30 degree bank, which we look over here, we find that is 1.54 and so we've kind of answered this question before, right? 33 times 
0.154 equals 38.02. Um, but it doesn't give us the 38 here. It gives us 40 pounds uh, and then 31 pounds. We know it has to be at least 38. Uh, in this case, it's going to be 40 pounds. And to be honest, I'm really not sure why. I think it's because it's trying to say that in addition to that, you might have to add uh, 1.15. I don't know really. I actually have no idea why this is the case. I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but basically you should be able to figure it out by what's what's there. You know it has to be at least 40 pounds. So sorry, I can't give you a better answer on that one. I honestly haven't figured out what they're talking about there. All right, this next question is another one I have a little bit of trouble with, but I think I can walk you through it. Um, it says, while monitoring the Cooperstown Sea Taff, you hear an aircraft uh, aircraft announce that they are midfield left downwind to runway 13. Where would the aircraft be relative to the runway? Now, um, the FAA kind of wants you to be able, if you're ever near an airport, you should be able to monitor air, tra air traffic with, let's say you had a, a UHF radio or something like that. And you might hear a pilot announce that they're taking off. You need to know what that sounds like when they radio that they're they're or on their final approach. It'll give you an idea of where an airplane is relative to the runway and relative to your position. So that's why it's asking you these kinds of questions. But honestly, they're quite a bit confusing to me. Um, so what I think should happen here is that you should kind of superimpose this idea from the... Uh, airplane flying handbook onto whatever direction the runway is facing. In this case, it's uh, 130 degrees. And if it's midfield left downwind, I'm not sure how important the left part is, but the downwind, and again, I, I, one of the things that confuses me about this is the lack of wind direction on these maps. But in this case, midfield left downwind, either way, uh, based on the choices we have, it would be east. This one sort of makes sense to me. Uh, there's another one on this practice test that uh, uh, you have to pay a little bit more attention. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, the next question, whose sole task during the SUAS operation is to watch out for SUAS, for the SUAS and report potential hazards to the rest of the crew? The important thing here is this sole task. It's not going to be the remote pilot in command because if the remote pilot in command was the only one operating the drone, there was nobody else there with him, then he wouldn't have the sole task of just watching the drone. He's got a lot of other tasks. So in this, that's the important part of the way they've worded this question, and it's going to be a visual observer. So that's in a situation where you have a visual observer, for example, if you were uh, using uh, you know, some kind of first person view or whatever where you couldn't watch the plane. The next question, refer to figure 21. You've been hired by a farmer to use your small UA to inspect his crops. The area you are to survey is in Devil's Lake West MOA east of area 2. How would you find out if the MOA is active? Okay, and we see this right here, uh, Devil's Lake West MOA. Now, Let's first, we see a red kind of line, uh, kind of odd line there. Let's check the legend out. And the legend is telling us it's an alert area and MOA military operations area. Okay, so we have one of these where I am. And basically, it's just, it's usually a big area where it is possible that military operations could be there. It is not. If it's like a warning area, it's almost certainly not going to be restricted for you to fly in, but they want you to know to be very, very careful. So um, in this case, the answer is going to be refer to the legend for the special use airspace phone number. Um, and what the and, and that's not the military operations directory. I don't even know if that's real or whatever. Maybe it is. This information is available at the small UAS database. Basically, the point is, is that MOAs and different alert areas like this, in the legend of the map, um, if you see the full map, it's going to give you the actual times, and in this case, phone number, to find out when 
that area is going to be active and what other restrictions there's going to be on that area. So a lot of those kinds of MOAs or uh, alert areas, you're going to actually refer to the legend in order to figure out sometimes it'll have hours of operation kind of thing or a phone number or other contact information. So refer to the legend. All right, so this next question is a little bit difficult. It says, what effect does high density altitude have on the efficiency of a UA propeller? This is one of those things that it's best just to kind of understand and understand the sort of weird tricks that are being played here as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the word high density altitude is the confusing part, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what you need to understand is that imagine air at the ground level is going to be much more dense. That makes sense, right? Because all the weight of the air above it is kind of pressing down on it. That's why like at the bottom of a sea, there's more pressure because there's just more weight. Same thing with air. The air is denser at ground level. And what is that? Uh, how does that affect your drone? Well, it actually is really good for it. A lot of air means the essentially the propellers can be more efficient. They can move more air around and do things um, because of the density of the air. So low to the ground is great for and high density essentially of air is great. But there's a confusing part because the way they word this, and I have no idea why, high density altitude means the exact reverse of high density. What it's referring to, if they just switched up the word high and the word altitude, high altitude density, that would be what it means. It means the, the density at high altitudes and which is the exact reverse. It's very thin and your propellers are not very efficient. The higher you go, the worse that your performance is going to be because the air is thinner way up high. And so it's the exact reverse of what it sounds like because it should read high altitude density, which would be low, but instead it says high density altitude, which is low, uh, but it just is worded weird. So, um, what effect does high density altitude have on the efficiency of a propeller? Well, it is decreased because at high altitudes the density is very low. I know it's confusing, but it's something you just need to stare at and understand what's happening. All right, the next question is an effective use of all available resources, human, hardware, and information prior to and during flight to ensure the successful outcome of an operation is called crew resource management is what they want. But don't be fooled into thinking that risk management and safety management systems cannot be answers because they are a part of this whole inter, you know, uh, thing that the FAA wants you to know and talks a lot about is essentially decision making and uh, how to avoid human error. It's a very important thing to familiarize yourself with in this particular case, the effective use of all available resources, human hardware and information, it wants you to know that crew resource management is a pretty all-encompassing thing for just um, using all of your resources to ensure a successful outcome of the operation. Which is true regarding the presence of alcohol within the human body? A small amount of alcohol increases vision acuity. Uh, no, judgment and decision-making abilities can be adversely affected. That one's obvious, but what I want you to know about this is they could ask you any number of questions about alcohol. They could say, you know, how long do you have to wait before drinking an alcoholic beverage? At least eight hours. Um, blood alcohol is 0.04. You need to know those numbers. You need to know things like um, it doesn't matter if you wait eight hours and you have a blood alcohol over 0.04, you know, that trumps it. You cannot fly a drone. Uh, so there's a section regarding drugs and alcohol. It's important to just read through at least once. It's one of those sections it's good to read through. Next, what could, what could be a consequence of operating a small unmanned aircraft above its maximum allowable weight? What could be the problems with that? You would have shorter endurance, increased maneuverability. No, you wouldn't probably increase your maneuverability or get faster speed. This one's obvious shorter endurance and does not want you to increase the aircraft above its maximum allowable weight. What should pilots state initially when telephoning a weather briefing facility for pre-flight pre weather information? Now this one, this one is uh, kind of tricky. I did not get this one the first few times I tried it. Um, 
and it's actually the location of the operation. Uh, you need to tell them if you're going to be telephoning a weather briefing facility for pre-flight pre information, you need to initially state where you are and not uh, your certificate number, not the address of the remote PIC, but the location of the operation. All right, this one says to refer to figure 12, what are the conditions for Chicago Midway Airport, KMDW? So let's first find KMDW. We're looking at this one. Um, let's just read through the METAR so we know what we're looking at. I don't think we've looked at one of these yet. So it's similar to the other ones, but uh, some distinctions. Let's look at it. It's the 12th day of the month, and it is at 1856 Zulu time. That's when it was issued. It's saying that the wind will be at 320 degrees at 5 knots. The visibility is going to be 1 and 1 half statute mile. It's going to be rain overcast at 700 feet. Now with METARS here, it's going to have the temperature in Celsius, 17 degrees and the dew point, 16. The reason why they group these together is because it's an indication of if there's going to be fog or mist or whatever, because in this case, they're less than three digits apart from one another. And that's an indication that you need to be aware of uh, fog, mist, and that sort of thing. Uh, so you want these to never be really too close to each other if you can help it. The next one with an A tells us this is going to be barometric pressure. And it is defined by putting a decimal point after the first two numbers. So uh, it is 29.80. And this RMK means a remark. So this is sort of like an addendum about this. And it is telling us that the RAB, which is a, a briefing up here that stands for rain began. Um, and it can either tell you the the time that it began or the minute past the hour it began if it's only two numbers in this case it's also uh two it, it's just two numbers oops so we know that the rain began at 35 minutes past the hour in what hour is that you can refer to when this was issued so uh let's answer the question at kmdw it's going to be 700 feet so it's one of these two we know that already and it's going to be overcast visibility we can see that and it's not going to let's see it's going to say one and one half miles the differences between heavy rain and rain is a plus or minus uh, this one does not say a plus or minus if it was minus it would be light rain with no qualifier in this case it's just rain if there was a plus before this ra it would be heavy rain so we know it is this one. The next question, the most effective method of scanning for other aircraft for collision avoidance is to use, this is, goes back to that system they were trying to teach us with that graph, um, is it regularly spaced concentration on the 3, 9, and 12 o'clock positions? peripheral vision by scanning small s sections and utilizing off-center viewing, or a series of short, regularly spaced eye movements to search each 10 degree sector. And in this case, we remember the 10 degrees, although this is worded kind of funny because in the study guide it basically says to overlap them by 10 degrees, but it can be up to the, the sectors themselves are 30 degrees. It's kind of confusing, but we know that we didn't hear anything about any of these first two. So although it's worded weird, the, error, the answer is a series of short, regularly spaced eye movements to search each 10 degree sector. A local TV station has hired a remote pilot to operate their small UA to cover breaking news stories. The remote pilot has had multiple near misses with obstacles on the ground and two small UAS accidents. What would be a solution for the news station to improve their operating safety culture? This one is purely a common sense question. It's uh, the news station uh, should recognize hazardous attitudes and situations and develop standards operating procedures to emphasize safety. And the rest make absolutely no sense if you're thinking logically about how they want you to answer those types of questions. 
This one says, refer to figure 26, what hazards to aircraft may exist in areas such as Devil's Lake East MOA? Okay, so here we are, Devil's Lake East MOA. What kind of hazards can we expect? Well, we see uh, this line right here, which is going to be a, a MOA, excludes airspace within restricted areas when active. So this is one of those situations where you would need to look at the legend to determine when it is active. But what kind of, and so you can fly in it, but you need to be very careful. So what can you be looking for? In this case, the answer is military training activities that necessitate acrobatic or abrupt flight maneuvers. But I would say that it's very, it's a very difficult question. And some of these answers will show up in other places. Um, and I honestly don't know how to tell the difference about what they want in certain situations. But in this case, uh, military training activities that necessitate acrobatic or abrupt flight maneuvers might happen in this area. Now, the other answers are a high volume of pilot training or unusual type of aerial activity. That really seems to me like it could just as easily be the answer to that because it, it just doesn't make any sense why that couldn't also be an answer to me. The next one, unusual, often invisible hazards such as aerial gunnery or guided missiles, that does not seem possible because this is one of these, these areas that are very broad. It's covering many towns. It's just trying to say, hey, there is stuff going on in this area, but probably not shooting missiles off to, you know, one town to the other kind of thing. So I don't think it's that one, but the, an the right answer is um, that there might be military training activities that necessitate acrobatic or abrupt flight maneuvers. It says refer to figure 20 area 3, so it's going to give us a specific place. With ATC authorization, you are operating your small unmanned aircraft approximately four statute mi miles southeast of Elizabeth City Regional Airport. What hazard is indicated to be in that area? All right, so we need to find Elizabeth City Regional Airport first, um, and it can take a while. I don't really have a really great system for this, but in this case, I found it pretty quick. Elizabeth City, and we do see this uh, area right here, caution, unmarked balloon on the cable to 3008 MSL. So it tells us exactly, it's trying to confuse you with AGL, MSL, but in this case it just tells you MSL. So no trouble there. Uh, we'll just use some logic to get that one figured out. Okay, so this question is one of these that I just don't understand. You will probably need to go somewhere else to figure this out. I've tried to figure it out. I've gone to all kinds of different places and read through the whole thing, but I just don't understand what they're trying to accomplish with this question. Um, the question is, while monitoring the Cooperstown CTAF, you hear an aircraft announce that they are left base to runway 31. Where would the aircraft be relative to the runway? Um, all right, well, if it's a left base, to me, I, I, you know, if I'm going to go by this, I would need to know which, which direction the wind is going. And I think that's what's messing me up because this obviously does not tell you what direction the wind is coming. The answer is south. The answer is that if you say that you're left base to runway 31. And again, looking at this chart, trying to understand where base is, it's relative to the wind. Uh, but I, I will get this question wrong nine times out of ten. I just cannot be, uh, <laughs> I just can't be relied upon to give you exactly how this works. I've been told again that this question did not appear on many people's uh, tests, but the point is, I guess, that I am not going to be able to tell you much about how to answer these kinds of questions. Please go elsewhere um, for more information on that. Okay, so this next question says, refer to figure 25, area 7. Important to pay attention to that area 7 with a map this convoluted and with this many airports in it. Um, it says, the airspace overline McKinney Airport, TKI, is controlled from the surface to... So let's look at area 7, and help, hopefully we'll be able to find McKinney Airport. Here it is. Now, McKinney Airport is surrounded by a blue dashed line. 
Now, usually when you see a circle of dashed lines, whether it be blue or magenta, it means that that airspace is going to go right down to the surface. And this number here within the circle is going to, because we know it goes down to the surface because of the dotted line, the 29 is going to tell us the ceiling of that airspace. Of course, adding our two zeros. So 2,900 feet from the surface to 2,900 feet. So let's look at the answers. Um, 700 feet AGL, 2,900 feet MSL, or 2,500. So we know it's going to be 2,900. I should also say that these are going to be in mean sea level as opposed to ground level. Ground level shows up in many different cases within these maps, but try to think of it as it's going to default to sea level. So the next question says, refer to figure 25, area 4, the airspace directly overlying Fort Worth Meacham Airport is Class B airspace to 10,000 feet MSL, Class C airspace to 5,000 feet MSL, or Class D airspace to 3,200 feet. So let's look at it. We've been told, especially in a map this big, Area 4. So let's look for Fort Worth Meacham in Area 4. And let's see if we can find it pretty quickly. Uh, here it is, Fort Worth Meacham. And what is the airspace? Now, you're kind of trying to, uh, you know, get you a little bit on this one. Fort Worth Meacham is definitely within this broader kind of upside down cake is the way airspace is sometimes uh, described. But let's, let's see what we can figure out about this. Now, we know because we're going to go to our legend real quick. Let's look real close at Fort Worth Meacham. And we see it does have a little dot dashed blue line around it, so we know it goes to the surface to 3,200 feet. We know that for sure. Um, let's see if that'll help us any. No, um, well, it does Class D airspace to 3,200. We don't know about the Class D. Let's check it out in our sectional legend and go down to airspace. Solid blue, Class B. Dashed blue, which we saw, is Class D airspace. So, based on that, let's look at it one more time really quickly. We know the blue dashed is class D. We know it goes from the surface to 3,200. Let's see if that makes any sense here. It is class D airspace to 3,200 feet MSL mean sea level. All right. Next question, refer to figure 20, area 6. What does the dashed magenta line east of Area 6 indicate? Okay, so let's go to Area 6. And we see the dashed magenta line. In this case, now normally if we saw a dashed magenta line in a circle around an airport, we would know that, it, that the airspace goes to the ground. But in this case, the uh, we're looking at this, by the way, but I just wanted to go ahead and explain while I'm here. This kind of faded magenta line means that the airspace does not start at the ground. We don't see a dashed magenta line around the airport, but it's trying to confuse you here about the dashed magenta line. This was a totally different usage for the dashed magenta line. If we look at it, we see it's talking about 1-1 uh, degrees west. And it goes, if you followed this on the chart, it would just keep going all the way up to the North Pole. And the reason is those lines are describing magnetic variation. The compass um, for magnetic north varies, and this is one of those lines telling you as you go across the country how much that magnetic uh, true north is, is varying. Next question, according to 14 CFR Part 107, the responsibility to inspect the small UAS to ensure it is in safe operating condition rests with the remote pilot in command, the visual observer, or the owner. The buck stops with the remote pilot in command in this particular case. Always be sure to read the question and be sure that it makes sense because they will try to trip you up on those kinds of questions. The, the ones that you think are easy, Make sure you're reading the whole thing. While operating a small unmanned aircraft, SUAS, you experience a flyaway and several people suffer injuries. Which of the following injuries requires reporting to the FAA? Scrapes and cuts bandaged on site, 
minor bruises, and injury requiring a hospitalization over 48 hours. That is the answer, and, and there are probably different ways you could word this because they're sort of ambiguous with, with what they refer to as serious injury. But I think, you know, unconsciousness is one of them and, and, and different things. Basically, just err on the side of it needs to be a serious injury in order to report it to, F to the FAA. But you do need to report to the FAA if you caused a serious injury. You have to do it. Next question. What is the antidote when a pilot has a hazardous attitude such as invulnerability? They describe that as it can't happen to me is the way that you are when you have an attitude of invulnerability. But again, it wants to know the antidote for invulnerability, which would be the opposite. It could happen to me. Next question, refer to figure 12. The wind direction and velocity at KJFK is from, so it wants to know about the wind direction and velocity at KJFK. Looking at KJFK right here, we know the, the wind direction and velocity is going to be under the KT, the knots, and it's going to be at 180 degrees at 4 knots. And here they're trying to trip you up by magnetic versus true. And when referring to, uh, you know, these METARs, you basically, if the way they say it, if you, if you see this in writing, it's going to be in, in true. Uh, true North. If you hear it on the radio, they do it differently, which you don't have to think about because it's not going to be applicable to you. But if you hear it on the radio, they'll do it in magnetic. If, if The way they say it, if you read it, it's true. If you read it, it's true when re referencing METARs. So in this case, KFJ, KJFK, 180 degrees, 4 knots, true. True North, not magnetic North. All right, so this next question is a latitude and longitude question. Refer to figure 22, area 3. Determine the approximate latitude and longitude of Shoshun, Shoshun County Airport. So let's look at area 3. There we find it, and we find the airport right there. So what's the latitude and longitude? Let's find our markers. we got a 116 and a 48. So we know this is 116. This is 116 in 30 minutes. This is 117. Again, this is 48, so this is 47.30 minutes. And let's just go from there. So 47.30, 1, 2, and about 47, uh, uh, 32. So we had 47.30, 40, 47.31, 47.32. All right. And 116.11 is what it's going to be, but let's just go ahead and count it. 116. 116, we can jump 10 and 11. So we know for sure that it is correct. The next question refer to figure 20, area 4. What hazards to the aircraft may exist in the restricted areas such as R5302B? All right, well, let's look at area 4 and find the restricted area. And we see a restricted area here. Now, Restricted areas are just that. They are restricted. And there are circumstances where you could fly in there, but you need to get permission from the people that are in charge of that. So restricted areas are uh, prefaced by the, the letter R. And so in this particular scenario, the answer is, well, let's just read the answers. Military training activities that necessitate acrobatic or abrupt flight maneuvers. Well, that's probably true, but... Let's keep going. Unusual, often invisible hazards such as aerial gunnery or guided missiles. That, that's what it wants you to know about restricted areas. You can't fly in it because there could be bombs going off in there or whatever. So, uh, And there is a high volume of pilot training or unusual. All these things are basically true, but the thing it wants you to know about restricted areas is there could be often invisible hazards such as gunnery or missiles. Okay, next question. According to 14 CFR Part 107, who is responsible for determining the performance of a small unmanned aircraft? It's kind of a weird question, determining the performance, but I, they're wanting you to say the remote piloting command is responsible. 
Next question, refer to figure 22, area four. The floor of the controlled airspace overlying the Coeur d'Alene Airport is, what is the floor is what it wants you to know. So let's look it up. We find Coeur d'Alene right here. Now, the floor in this particular area is going to be the surface because we see a dashed magenta line. That means that right around this airport, the airspace is going to go all the way to the surface. Let's see how they want, to, want us to answer this. It says, at the surface. Well, that's pretty much it because they're asking what the floor is. So the floor is at the surface. Refer to figure 15 in the TAF for KMEM. What does SHRA stand for? Well, we don't really even need to refer to that because we know that this stands for showers and rain. And so basically that means rain showers. The most comprehensive information on a given airport is provided by, this is basically a duplicate of the question we saw before, comprehensive information about an airport is provided by the chart supplements. Um, that is the extra part of those charts that you don't, we haven't really seen. There is examples of it in the materials, but um, next question, refer to figure 22. Which airport is located at approximately 47 degrees 32 minutes north latitude and 116.11 west longitude. So let's look at it 47 degrees 32. Let's just go ahead and do it. So we know 48 is here. So this is 47 30, 1, 2, 47 degrees 32. It's probably this Shoshun, Shoshun, whatever. But let's see 116 11. And let's find our markers 116 10 11. Everything lines up. It is Shoshun, Shoshun, whatever that is. And I'm sure people will let me know. Okay, when operating near an uncontrolled airport, which frequency should the remote pilot use to monitor air traffic? And this is that CTAF number. When we look at those charts, it's got the C with a circle around it. The CTAF frequency is what you would use to monitor air traffic. Um, the section on this is probably important to, to look up because Unicom and these other frequencies are uh, sometimes used to basically, uh, I don't want to go into the whole thing because I might say something wrong, but it is an important thing to look up. The rate, at least read through one time the section in the study guide about radio. Next, according to 14 CFR part 48, when would a small UA owner, UA owner not be permitted to register it? So you cannot register a drone if the owner is less than 13 years of age. So on your 13th birthday, you can register it, but not before then. Um, what is the purpose of the rudder on an airplane? For this, uh, you know, it, it's good to know what pitch, yaw, and roll is. And I think that if you looked at a graph, you could see, you could eliminate two of them all, already. Uh, pitch is pretty easy. It's it's how much the nose is pointing up or down. We get pitch. Pitch makes sense to us. Roll kind of also makes sense if you think of it in terms of like a, a fighter aircraft that's doing those big rolls on their axis, their longitudinal axis. That's a roll. And yaw is, for lack of a better way to put it, turning left and right. So we know what a rudder is on an airplane and it is turning left to right, basically, which is yaw. And that is going to be the answer to that one. Which factor would tend to increase the density altitude at a given airport? So this is that confusing idea of density altitude. What's going to increase the density altitude? So try to think increase means high density altitude, which means um, the the density at high altitudes, which means low density. Uh, I know it's crazy. Basically, what's going to increase the density altitude at a given airport? It almost doesn't matter about all those intricacies because what they want you to know here is that temperature 
can uh, be an effect to density altitude. And the reason is, is because when air heats or cools, it causes it to rise, etc. And that can increase the density altitude. So the temperature is the thing, not the humidity, not the barometric pressure, but the temperature is what you need to consider when uh, talking about changes to density altitude or essentially how dense the air is in a given place. Next question, refer to figure 22, area one. The floor of the controlled airspace overlying the Sandpoint Airport is. So we want to know the floor of the airport and it tells us to look in area one. So here's the Sandpoint Airport. What is the floor? Now in this case, we have the sort of uh, gradient magenta circle around this. What this means is that this area is okay to fly a drone in. I mean, up to a certain level. And it's going to either be 700 or 1,200 feet. It depends on the situation. But uh, since your drone cannot legally fly over 400 feet, then you could fly within one of these magenta circles as long as there's not a dashed magenta circle because we know that that airspace goes down to the surface. Um, let's see what we can see here. The answers it wants is either 700 feet AGL at the surface or 700 feet MSL. So we know, um, as I said, and I probably ought to look at the legend just to kind of let you see this. Um, when you see that faded magenta line, class E airspace with a floor of 700 feet above surface, so we know it's going to be in surface um, measurements in this particular case, that laterally abuts Class G airspace, etc. So, but it also says Class E airspace with a floor of 700 feet above surface that laterally abuts 1,200 feet or higher Class E airspace. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure when to determine whether this is 700 or 1,200 feet. I know it's one of the other. I know <laughs> It's not exactly great for a tutorial video, but the point is that we don't need to know because in this case it says it, it's all 700 feet and we know it's not at the surface and the question is AGL or MSL. We know it's AGL from the legend, but for whatever reason in this case it's always going to be about ground level. And I guess that makes sense because this is obviously a very hilly terrain where the elevations above sea level are quite high, so it really only matters how far above the airport, wherever it lands, uh, in terms of its altitude, uh, can you fly? And in this case, 700 feet. AGL is the answer. I hope that made sense to you. Next question, which crew member is required to be under the direct supervision of the remote PIC, PIC when operating an SUAS? Now, in this case, it's a very weirdly worded question, but what it wants you to know basically is that the person manipulating the controls this this question only makes sense if the remote PIC is not the one mani manipulating the controls under the part 107 you as a part 107 holder can actually supervise somebody that does not have it or uh, somebody that's not licensed if you will to operate the controls but they and they don't have to have it but you need to be there you need to be the remote pilot in command for that situation so when it asks the question which crew member is required to be under the direct supervision of the remote PIC so this is assuming you have more than one person there and that there's a person manipulating the controls it's a weird question but it just wants you to know that there can be a person manipulating the controls that's not licensed as long as you are there Next question, refer to figure 23, area 3, what is the floor of the Savannah C-Class air, airspace at the shelf or outer circle? Okay, so we're looking for the floor of the outer circle. In this case, we know it's going to be class C because of the non-dashed magenta line. Um, and remember, this is an upside down wedding cake where um, this inner circle goes from the surface to 4,100 feet AGL, or rather MSL, so this is sea level, 
whenever it's doing these bra these fraction kind of numbers, it's defaulting to C level. Um, so, but it wants to know what the outer level is, and it wants to know what the floor is. In this case, it is 1300. The outer level of this um, upside down wedding cake, and the floor is 1300, and we know it's going to be MSL because it's mean sea level when it's in these kinds of brackets inside major class airspace like that. Next question, what are the characteristics of moist, unstable air mass? One of those things you just got to sit and think about. Think about your how you remembered this. Uh, unstable air mass, it's moist, and what is it going to be? Haze and smoke, poor visibility, smooth air, or turbulence and showery precipitation? Well, uh, it's unstable, so that, remember that's a day that you want to go out in. A cumulus, beautiful cumulus clouds, except there is an upward air draft and clear visibility. Uh, but for whatever reason, they always say showery precipitation whenever that is going on. Um, the answer is turbulence and showery precipitation for this particular uh, one. And again, referring you back to the earlier discussion on those points. Okay, so this is another one of those frustrating questions. It seems like it's going to be another latitude and longitude question, but let's just read it. It says, refer to figure 26, area 4. You have been hired to inspect the tower under construction at 46.9 north and 98.6 west near Jamestown Regional. What must you receive prior to flying your unmanned aircraft in this area? Now, the thing about this is the decimal points. So it's saying 46.9 and 98.6. These are not minutes. So it's 46 degrees, and it's not 0.9 minutes, and it's not 98 degrees, 0.6 minutes. It's actually a decimal point. So it's almost, in this case, 46.9. It's almost 47 degrees. And I'm not exactly sure how they're measuring this. You almost have to use your common sense to figure this out because it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Okay. Let's back up. So, for example, if 98 degrees 0.5, if you wanted to render this in a decimal, based on how these charts work, 98 degrees 30 minutes would be in between, right? 98 degrees 0.5 should be 98 degrees 30 minutes, but it's 0.1 more, so it should be around 98 degrees point, what is that? Uh, 30 plus 10 is 40, but that number doesn't quite add up. To make a long story short, you have to basically use your, uh, you know, common sense to come up with where 0. 0.6 between, let's say, 98 here and 98.9 here is. Well, we know this is 5, so 0. 0.6 is probably somewhere around here, technically right around here, but there's no under construction tower right around here. So if we go back and we find this one right here. We see the UC meaning under construction. And that's almost certainly what it's telling us to do here. Uh, the issue is that this particular tower is in the magenta line. So we know that the uh, airspace is going to the surface, meaning you really, if you're going to fly here, you need to contact the air traffic control. This is not a military zone. This not, question isn't about that. So not that. We're going to say authori authorization from the ATC. This is another tricky one that I don't quite understand. It says refer to figure 21, the terrain elevation of the light tan area between my note area 1 and Audubon Lake area 2 varies from. So it wants to know the terrain elevation of this light tan area. Now we can look at this legend thing down here and it says that a light tan can vary from 2,000 to 3,000. Is that the answer? No, because it doesn't give you a 2,000 to 3,000. It gives you 2,000 to 2,500 or 2,000 to 2,700. The correct answer, by the way, is 2,000 to 2,500 MSL. But this is why that doesn't make sense to me, is that looking at the elevation of this area from what we can tell, we see items over 2,500 here, uh, certainly well over 2,500 and over 2,700 for that matter. Um, if they're wanting you to draw a straight line or something, it still doesn't work because we've got plenty of things that are over uh, 2,500 uh, in a straight line. We see that 2,800 
is what it's clearly telling you to fly over. Uh, the highest elevation in this area is, uh, you know, these 28s. So really nothing makes sense on this. I have no idea why the correct answer is 2,000 to 2,500 feet. And it's not just me. I've been looking at some forums to try to figure this out. And <laughs> people are just having trouble with this question. And I honestly don't know what to tell you about why the correct answer to this particular question is 2,000 to 2,500. But basically, if you, if you know, please describe it in the comments because I and many other people are at a loss for this particular question. Next question, according to 14 CFR Part 107, the remote piloting command of a small unmanned aircraft planning to operate within Class C airspace is required to uh, file a flight plan, is required to receive ATC authorization, or must use a visual observer. This is a pretty common sense one if you understand the basics. If you're going to fly in Class C airspace, you need to get air traffic control authorization. Which crew member must hold a remote pilot certificate with a SUAS rating? And that's going to be the remote pilot uh, in command. And the final question, under what condition should an operator of a small UA established schedule maintenance or protocol? So basically, you need to inspect your drone before every flight, and you need to have a scheduled maintenance protocol. If your manufacturer, if DJI or whatever, does not include in the instructions a maintenance protocol that you need to follow, then you need to create your own maintenance protocol, and you need to create your own um, a checklist, a flight checklist, or whatever. So the answer to this is when the manufacturer does not provide a maintenance schedule um, is the answer to that question. All right, this next question. You are a part of a news crew operating at SUAS to cover a breaking story. You experience a flyaway during your landing. An unmanned aircraft strikes a vehicle, causing approximately $800 worth of damage. When, you, when must you report the accident to the FAA? Let me also talk about a flyaway here, something that they may want you to know. Flyaways happen a lot of times because you get too close to a building or something that has metal in it or some other kind of magnetic interference and the compass in your drone will go crazy. It'll point, you know, all kinds of different directions causing your drone to have to self-correct to try to deal with what it thinks is happening and it can cause all kinds of problems it can fly away so they actually will ask you questions about that you need to know that that's essentially what's happening if you well let's put it this way if you know that that's what's happening you will be able to answer some questions that they ask you about that but here they're saying that eight hundred dollars worth of damage has been done in this case you have to file a report within 10 days eight hundred dollars does not include your drone price it means Whatever your drone hit, if it caused $800 worth of damage to that, you have to report it to the FAA within 10 days. Next question. You have received an Outlook briefing from Flight Service through 1-800-WXBrief.com. The briefing indicates you can expect a low-level temperature inversion with high relative humidity. What weather conditions would you expect? The correct answer here is smooth air, poor visibility, fog, haze, or low clouds um, they talk in the weather section and it's important to in the study guide to read about temperature inversion it's kind of weird basically it cause it's caused by things like the ground um, you know causing a temperature change to the low level air for example instead of warm air on the bottom and cold air on the top it can flip and there can be warm air on the top or cold air on the bottom and different things like that. In this case uh, the humidity and different things tell us we're gonna have smooth air, um, poor visibility, fog, haze, or low clouds. Basically study temperature inversion in your study guide. Next question to avoid uh, although I should say <laughs> You know, I don't know how many questions they're going to ask you about that. They didn't on my test, but um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to understand at least what they want you to know about temperature inversion. 
the next question to avoid striking guy wires how far from a skeletal tower should you operate your aircraft okay guy wires you can think of them like uh, the wires that usually at an angle supporting some kind of tower structure and they can be hard to see and different things and you need to know that you are supposed to say stay 2,000 feet is the answer to that question it's just one of those memorization things you need to stay 2,000 feet away from guy wires next question safety is an important element for a remote pilot to consider prior to operating an unmanned aircraft system to prevent the final link in the accident chain a remote pilot must consider which methodology okay here we come back to this idea I can't stress this enough they're gonna ask you a ton of questions about you know uh, crew resource management sa the safety management system risk management they have like this whole thing about all that stuff and the main thing that you need to do is know you I mean you need to read through that section you really do and know exactly I mean you don't have to memorize the acronyms and everything but you need to know what acronym uh, that they come up with for like example PAVE P-A-V-E you need to know what they want you to know about that what why would you need to at least remember it even if you didn't remember exactly what it was what the elements were you need to know what its purpose is it's important uh, in this case it is risk management and they'll they'll throw you some curveballs with this type of question where it might be crew resource management or risk management don't don't do a memorization thing and say okay this is risk management because you will get it wrong because they'll switch it up and do all kinds of interesting stuff with this with this area um, next question to ensure that the unmanned aircraft center of gravity limits are not exceeded follow the aircraft loading instructions specified in the pilots operating handbook uh, or UAS flight manual so they again with this kind of stuff they basically want you anything drone specific like your drone uh, might weigh a little bit different you need to know they're, they're gonna point you back to your DJI handbook or wherever you got your drone the instructions for that um, what does a line of the line of latitude at area 4 measure okay well let's look at area 4 and basically we see a line of latitude lots of lines of latitude and just like all lines of latitude the answer is going to be the degree of latitude north and south from the equator so we really wouldn't even had to look at the chart for that particular question the next question who is ultimately responsible for preventing a hazardous situation before an accident occurs who's res responsible is the key word responsible and that's going to be the pilot in command. I mean, you could say, well, the person manipulating the controls, they're responsible for preventing a hazardous situation. No, the remote pilot in command is because the person manipulating the controls is under his command. The next uh, question, the angle of attack at which an airplane wing stalls will remain the same regardless of gross weight, change with an increase in gross weight, or increase if the center of gravity is moved forward. Um, the answer is remain the same regardless of gross weight so this is a physics thing that in which weight is not a factor so uh, they seem to make that a point in several of these test questions this the suffix nimbus used in uh, naming clouds means a cloud with extensive vertical development a middle cloud containing ice pellets or a rain cloud now it's you there's nimbus is actually a latin word that does mean like rain or something like that so you will know it's a rain cloud if you know that little factoid but this is a confusing question if you didn't just know that because um you know some of these could make sense i can see this is a tough question if you didn't know that nimbus means a rain cloud so a cumulus cloud when it becomes a cumulonimbus cloud and remember cumulonimbus is the only acronym that appears in the weather reports they'll let you know if it's a cumulonimbus cloud because that's the that's the dangerous one for pilots so next question what is the valid period for the TAF at KMEM so let's look KMEM the entire valid period remember all this stuff down here is going to be a part of 
this right here. The, I mean, it's gonna. The first date is gonna be when it was issued. The second date is when it's valid through this whole thing. So we know it's 1218 to 1324, and so we are gonna click this right here. 1218 to 1324 is the correct answer for that one. All right, the next question says, the floor of, of Class B airspace at Addison Airport is, and this is a really, really tough one. So first of all, it's telling us to look in Area 2. So we'll zoom in on that, and we'll try to find Addison Airport. Let's get a little closer if I can. Um, Addison Airport is right here. Um, now this is very, very, very tricky. So they've done a number of things here. You can see we would be tempted with this dotted line which generally means it's going to be starting at the surface and here's the airport keep in mind you've got to look for where the runway is or Addison's runway and in this case it's right here but this dotted line does not seem to continue at least I can't see this dotted line continuing into this airspace so this airspace is actually a part of in, in this blue solid line now what does that mean? Well, the floor, it wants us to know where the floor is, but this question is messed up because this big two here, which was added at, on top of the sectional chart, is actually covering up a fraction that shows us that it's uh, 2,500 feet. We can see the 25 there, but it's actually 25, and it's a fraction kind of like this over here, the 1, 10, and 20. So this is 2,500 is the answer. And with these sectional charts, Probably the biggest number of questions that are going to be the hardest questions for this are things about airspace floors and ceilings. And, you know, when, when you're looking at solid line airspace like this, you usually want to look for a fraction like this to tell you what the floor and ceiling is. This is going to be mean sea level numbers. Um, both of these numbers are mean sea level, and of course, you got to add two zeros to them. But that's important but in general there's a lot of just airspace questions if you're taking notes and there's another thing that you need to study I would watch an entirely different set of videos just watch two or three really good ones about airspace in general and let some of that stuff soak in with sectional charts and whatever you can find I'll put a, a few links in the description of uh, ones as I find them so anyway the answer to this is 2500 feet we saw the 25 uh, in that fraction kind of an unfair question really because of that this question says <clears throat> this question says to get a complete weather overview for the planned f flight the remote pilot in command should obtain a what type of weather briefing and the answer is a standard briefing the standard briefing is um just what uh, the aviation weather center calls it it calls it a standard briefing and it's got um, weather information that you will need to know. I mean, there are more detailed ones, but this one is just called the standard briefing, and that's what it wants you to know to get a complete weather overview for the planned flight. Next question, which of the following is considered a ceiling? Okay, so we're typically used to thinking of ceilings in terms of airspace questions, but in terms of weather, the word ceiling refers to a broken or overcast cloud layer and they do ask questions about this and what you need to keep in mind is the the that it's basically the overcast layer at the highest point basically I mean you know from the weather briefings the TAFs and METARs etc or the TAFs anyway that they describe di the different cloud layers at different elevation but the ceiling of that is the overclass overcast cloud layer at the top most position and that might not be the best exact way to explain it, but knowing it like that anyway helps you to answer the questions that they will ask about it. The next is a stable air mass is most, like, is most likely to have which characteristics? So we know from re re basically memorizing this that a stable air mass is one that has a uh, smooth air. It's going to be raining, it's going to be poor vis visibility, and, but it's going to be stable air. Or smooth air, rather. What, which technique should a remote pilot use to scan for traffic? A remote pilot should concentrate on relative movement detected in the per peripheral vision area, continuously scan the sky from left to right, 
or systematically focus on different segments of the sky for short intervals. That's the one, the last one, systematically focus on different segments of the sky. Now, they didn't use the 10% thing, which they sometimes will do. 10% um, is going to be uh, something to associate, it with, associate with that question. 30% is actually in the study guide too, both 30% and 10%. But 10% uh, uh, seems to be the thing that they bring up most often. So the next question, the floor of Class B airspace overline Hicks Airport north-northwest of Fort Worth Meacham is, so is it going to be 4,300 or at the service, surface? Um, so let's look. Hicks Airport in Area 4. And here we find it, Hicks Airport, Area 4. So it wants to know, what does it want to know? The uh, floor of the airspace. So here is the runway. The runway is not in any, it's not in this one, this dotted line. It's not in any other dotted lines I can see. So it is actually in between the, uh, one of these layers of this upside down uh, cake here. So once under the floor, so we probably should look for this area to see if we can find one of those fractions. And we're looking, 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 uh, and it seems to be right here. It, this floor is 4,000 feet MSL, and the ceiling is 110 or 11,000 feet MSL, and that is the most applicable to this. Now, Again, I want to stress on this. Sometimes they'll ask you without any kind of thing like that, no fractions to look at. They just want you to know some ceiling information. For example, airports that don't have anything, uh, around, I mean, any other airspace to t contend with. I mean, just learn as much as you can about airspace. Try to try to feel like you know what A, B, D, and C airspace is all about, and at least has how it relates to sectional charts. But again, we looked at the fraction, we saw 110 over 40, meaning this was going to be a 4,000 foot ceiling, or rather floor, excuse me. Next question, when requesting a waiver, the required documents should be presented to the FAA at least how many days prior to the planned operation? And again, we have 90 days, it's going to ask this in terms of unspecified waiver, but it can also be uh, other things. 90 days is the day to you might have to wait to receive an answer. Next question. Identify the hazardous attitude or characteristic a remote pilot displays while taking risks in order to impress others. This particular one is macho. They describe all these in detail and they do ask a lot of questions about these. So just at least intuitively understand what they're trying to say with these attitudes and why they want you to know them. Next question. After receiving a Part 107 remote pilot certificate with an SUAS rating, how often must you satisfy recurrent, recurrent training requirements? Now the answer here is 24 months or two years, but I would read again this section because they asked me a question like this and gave me basically these options, but I got this one wrong on the test. I mean it's right here. But the question was worded differently about, but on the same topic. So try to understand, read the section about getting your, how often you have to renew and different things like that, because it will come up, or at least it did with me. Next question, you have been hired by a farmer to use your small UA to inspect his crops. The area that you are to survey is in the Devil's Lake West MOA, east of area two. How would you find out if the MOA is active? And I tell you, these answers are all over the board. Um, in this case, it is going to be a restricted. It's got this, uh, the red lines. Let's go to the legend real quick to double check what this says about that. And it says it's an alert area and MOA, military operations area. So how are you going to find that out? And, and we talked before, a lot of those MOAs and other things, the answer is to look at the legend of the map. We made the, a big point about that, that some of the answers to these questions are legends of a map. In this case, the answer is contact flight service. Remember, flight service 
is a proper noun flight the you know flight service it's a um automated system where they can warn you about what, what things are active and it's where you can get other things as well other notifications question which of the following source of information should you consult when first determining what maintenance should be performed on an S S U A S or its components so what are you going to look for to find out what maintenance should be done on your drone? This is a drone specific question because it will be different per drone. So they want you to look for the manufacturer's guidance. Um, it doesn't want you to look at part 107. That's just about not that. <laughs> Local pilot best practices? No, of course not. Next question. What are the characteristics of stable air? Going back to our thing here. So stable air is going to have poor visibility and steady precip precipitation. Not good visibility and steady precipitation or poor visibility and intermittent precipitation. We know this because we've had to memorize exactly what stable and unstable air is. Next question. Scheduled maintenance should be performed in accordance with the manufacturer's suggested procedures, not the contractor requirements, not stipulations in part 43. What are characteristics of unstable air? So unstable air, we're happy to be outside. We've got some turbulence though because of that those upward moving drafts, but we do have good surface visibility. This question is important to know about. It says the control tower frequency for Addison Airport is, now we look at Air, Addison Airport in area two, so let's find it. Here it is, and here is the information they, they want you to know. We see the C, and we know that the answer over there is to the left, and the Addis is to the right. Now, they'll ask you a lot of questions about these two different things. You need to kind of know what these are and how to find them. The C, again, we look at the legend, it'll say it's a CTAF, and that's a common traffic advisory something. And basically what that means is, or frequency, I guess is the last one, and you find that to the left, and it, it's where pilots can announce their in intentions. Uh, I'm about to take off, I'm about to land, I'm going to enter traffic, whatever. Any, they, that's where they announce their in intentions, and that's important for you, because if you had, let's say, a radio or something, you could know that there was a plane taking off, because they, it's a public party line kind of thing. Addis, on the other hand, the A stands for automatic uh, terminal something, I don't know. But basically what it is, is a recorded automatic free, uh, radio transmission that has general information about the airport. And that can include the weather conditions, which runways are open, um, you know, no TAMs or anything that people might need to know. And the reason that they have this automated system for approaching aircraft to just listen to about that airport is that it reduces basically reduces the workload for the people in the tower and sometimes you don't, can't even contact a person in the tower so uh, the Addis gives them the general information and then the CTAF is where you can announce your intentions to um, enter that airspace or blah 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 so the answer to this question of course is well the way they acted is the, asked it is a little confusing the control tower frequency for Addison Airport is and I mean technically uh, but it's 126.0. It's the CTAF they're looking for, the control tower frequency. So that is here. Next question, which would most likely result in hyperventilation? Here they want you to know that hyperventilization hyper can happen as a result of emotional tension, anxiety, or fear. They don't want you to get too scared and then hyperventilate. That's the answer that they want for the cause of hyperventilation. But technically, of course, hyperventilation is caused by uh, too much oxygen in your bloodstream. Um, I guess that's the, I don't know, you get the point. Next question. The chart shows a gray line with VR1667, VR blah, 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 these VR numbers. Could this area present a hazard to the operations of a small uh, UA? So let's take a look. Okay. There's no figure there. There we go. Area 2. And here is what they're talking about. And when you see these, these black lines like this, we could look at the legend, but they are military training routes. Four of them really close together. Sometimes there's just one. In this case, there's four close together. 
one of the things they want you to know about these is that military planes can go lower than you would expect them to go in these routes. Um, sometimes it's not exactly clearly specified because it's a military training route and they can do a lot of different things there. So they will want you to know that and sometimes it comes up in the answers. So the options they give us here is yes, the defined route provides traffic separation to manned aircraft. Yes, this is a military training route from 1500 feet AGL and below. No, all operations will be above 400 feet. That's what they don't want you to think about military training things. They want you to know that it can be from 1500 feet and below. So you need to be careful, extra careful along a military training route because it could really get into your airspace or to where your drone is. Next question. Under what condition would a small UAS not have to be registered before it is operated in the United States? Here, it's only going to be if the aircraft weighs less than 0.55 pounds on takeoff, including everything that is on board or attached to the aircraft. So only if you basically have a little toy that um, really is just not even a drone. Uh, so what I'm saying here is very few drones weigh less than 0.55 five five pounds less than half a pound so you do not need to register that one what is the floor of the controlled airspace along v15 okay let's take a look okay v15 is a little different it's this blue line and it's not going to tell you what the floor is here this is like think of it like an interstate for um airlines and things like that. These are like commonly common routes that they take from place to place and they're not going to be flying too low. In fact it's going to be 1200 feet AGL um, and it's just going to be a number that you kind of have to remember with that. The floor of those, I mean you can fly of course as an, under a drone it's no big deal but you do need to pay more attention because who knows what could happen. The plane could be having trouble or whatever. So. 1200 feet AGL is the floor of that airspace, but it is a common uh, traffic area. Next question, when using a small U UA in a commercial operation, who is responsible for briefing the participants about the emergency procedures? Well, we got to go back to the remote PIC. You're not going to have a FA inspector in charge every time you fly your drone. It's the remote PIC. You are a remote pilot for a co-op energy service provider. You are, you are to use your UA to inspect power lines in a remote area 15 hours away from your home office. After the drive, fatigue impacts your abilities to complete your assignment on time. Fatigue can be recognized as being an impaired state. They want you to know that being tired, in the same way they want you to know that you can take over-the-counter drugs or um, any kind of medication can actually impair your state. They want you to just know that, like... As broad as possible, there are things that can impair you to flying safely. Next question, outside control hours, Class D airspace is, you know, these questions, I didn't get a question like this, but, wait, did I? I didn't get a question exactly like this, but like I said, I was tripped up on a lot of the airspace questions because they, to my mind, weren't exactly covered everywhere. Um, so the answer is class G. Class D reverts to class G in this answer. But I've seen a lot of different things out there. You can't just say, well, I know that outside control air areas, let's say class E reverts one down, or that it's actually about weather. Um, you need to know <laughs> if they're going to have weather reports, and that affects whether or not they revert down to different things. It's all over the board, and these questions are really difficult. But in this case, the answer is Class G. It's just another reason to uh, look up more about airspace. Next question. How often is the remote PIC required to inspect the SUAS to ensure that it is in, con uh, in a condition for safe operation? And you need to inspect it before each flight. Every single flight needs to have a pre-flight inspection. And the FAA wants you to really know that. Next question, who is responsible for ensuring that there are enough crew members for a given S 
UAS operation and the person responsible for that is the remote pilot in command. Don't take all these as a gimme though. You make sure you read the question and make sure you know exactly what it's asking. Next question, a stable air mass is most likely to have which characteristics? Now this one is trying to trip you up a little bit because it's giving you two things that are in a stable air mass. Showery precipitation and poor surface visibility. Both of those are part of stable air mass, but it's asking you what's most likely uh, between those two. And uh, the answer is poor surface visibility but I honestly don't know why that is more likely than showery precipitation. I guess it makes some kind of sense, but um, I don't remember learning that exactly. I put that away. I'm sure it's in there somewhere in the study guide, but that's the answer. Poor surface vi visibility is more likely than showery precipitation in a stable air mass, although they have both. The next question is, a person without a Part 107 remote pilot certificate may operate an SUAS for commercial operations only when the visual observer participates, never under the direct supervision of a remote PIC. The answer is under the direct supervision of a remote, a certified remote PIC. So somebody without a certificate can fly a commercial mission if they are in the command of the remote pilot. All right, so thanks for watching, and please subscribe if you got a lot out of this, and uh, it'll help you remember where the video is so you can watch it a number of times. I would, as I said before, also recommend watching the uh, Tony Northrup video about the Part 107, and um, good luck.